Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to WS2 webinars. And today, uh, I'm Kavin Rodrigo from WS2 Financial Solutions. I'm a senior software engineer working there on the Open Banking project. And today, I would like to talk about uh, strong customer authentication and uh, how to get it ready for PSD2. So I would like to give a quick webinar outline on what I would like to discuss on. First off, uh, a motivation on this webinar, because uh, PSD2, as you know, went live on September 14th, that is last month. And why are we still discuss, discussing about this? And next off, uh, I would like to define strong customer authentication and, and give the given context on, of open banking and elements of SCA and the user experience impacts as well. Next up, we'll look at uh, how providing how to provide better SE experiences for customers. And uh, finally, we'll see how WSO2 Open Banking caters to SCA and Open Banking in general. So the motivation. As I said uh, in, the, uh, in the previous slide, uh, PSD2 went live on September 14. And in that stage, uh, we thought that everything would be going great. But then we industry author industrial authorities like EBA and the FCA had concerns regarding adaptation of open banking and PSD2 in general. So the problem was the stakeholders were not still ready for SCA and the FCA, Financial Conduct Authority of UK, pushed the SCA deadline 18 months ahead. And uh, this was in response to a research done by the European Banking Association and all the other SMEs saying that SCA is not ready yet. And they acknowledge the complexity of SCA requirements. And uh, again, as I said, customer adoption. And what instead they proposed was a phased rollout, rollout of PSD2 SCA. So the main part of this uh, webinar is strong customer authentication. So what is SCA trying to solve here? PSD2 allows uh, accredited third parties to gain access to customer accounts and payment services. And this, is ne this needs to be done with consumer consent. And what SCA is trying to do is, SCA is the sort of glue that, that sticks identity and the APIs together, ensuring that all the... Hello, I'm sorry about that. Uh, we had a small problem with our network, uh, but I think we're back. So, okay, let's uh, pick it up. So as I said, what SCA is trying to solve is the PSD2 consent problem, because as PSD2 said, uh, PSD2 specification implies that all the uh, third party access is done through explicit customer consent. And uh, what it tries to do is uh, it ensures that the co consenting customer is not a fraudulent entity that is attempting to gain access. And uh, this and other parts like dynamic linking also uh, sticks in with it, this, but uh, today we are just gonna discuss about SCA. So let's look at uh, SCA in context of open banking for someone who may not be familiar with uh, PSD2 flows. So first off, uh, our main actors in this scenario is the PSU. PSU is the payment service user, so that can be a consumer or another organization. And next off is the TPP, the third party that is uh, harnessing the ASPSP, the bank's data. So first off, the PSU starts off by initiating the application from the third party side. This may be just a simple login button or some sort of automated process. And the TPP's first task is to request consent regarding what the PSU wants. So in this case, for example, let's say uh, this PSU wants to get uh, account information for a couple of months. The consent will be sent to the ASPSP. Now, how is the ASPSP going to verify that the consent was actually uh, initiated by the PSU? So what the ASPSP will be doing is confirming the consent with the PSU saying, this TPP wants to access your account for this certain number of months. Do you confirm this consent? And in that case, if the PSU confirms the consent, the TPP will be uh, received with the consent status 
and perform the transaction in this case getting the account details uh, so this is the this is a kind of high level we want uh, how how the sca process works and we are looking at number three here number three is where the strong custom authentication happens so if you just think about it uh, all of these other things like the request uh, request for consent and getting the transaction is all done behind the scene but the sca part is with the customer so sca is kind of a, a facade that is uh, presented at the psu uh, on the open banking space so what are the benefits of sca for open banking so as sca is built SCA was built in mind uh, with the open banking specifications. So what happens there is transactions can only take place with user consent. It's by design made to make sure that transactions can uh, only take place with explicit consent. And it gives assurance to banks and users that the request was understood and agreed upon. Uh, some might call it uh, visibis. It doesn't roll off the tongue like visibig but uh, it's what you see is what you sign and uh, what happens next is it promotes transparency throughout the transaction to the consumer and the bank this is kind of done through another part of our psd2 called dynamic linking so the whole transaction will hold the consent the state of the consent and the transaction value as well and other attributes such as uh, expiry date and uh, one of the most uh, one of the most important parts parts is uh, it strongly authenticates the user to avoid any fraudsters. Regarding the specification, uh, the specification this is uh, apart from Article 12 for PSD2. It says strong custom authentication means an authentication based on the use of two or more factors, and SEA is a mandatory requirement for PSD2 implementers. And as this uh, statement says, authentication should take place in two or more elements. Uh, this is actually from Article 12 of uh, PSD2. So what do they mean by use of two or more elements? First, you may take this as multi-factor authentication or second-factor authentication. In a way, it is multi-factor authentication, but uh, more consideration is taken place to ensure that the factors are safe. So they have divided the authentication mechanisms into three elements. So these are the three elements of SCA. First off, you have knowledge, that something that the user knows. So this can be something in your memory, like the password or PIN. And next off, the second factor is possession, uh, the something, user, something the user has. So this can be a smart device like mobile phone or separate authentication device. And next off, you have a, this third element is inherence something that the user is. This can be uh, fingerprint identification, voice patterns, uh, keystroke dynamics. There's a lot of uh, factors that can clarify under, that can be categorized under inherence. So those are the three elements of SCA and how we pair them is important. For example, you can't pair just uh, a couple of knowledges, knowledge elements and call it SCA. That is not correct. If you want uh, more information regarding pairings of SCA, uh, the European Banking Association had done a nice research and a paper on regarding it. So I'll show you a couple of pairings of SCA. So what is considered as SCA here? So I have two correct examples and one incorrect example. So one is user identifier and password. So this is your general username and password, which is categorized under knowledge, and then SMS one-time password. So SMS one-time password is sent to your mobile phone and it's categorized under possession. This is one of the most boilerplate common second factor authentication examples and it is, and it is uh, considered as SCA. Next off, it can be something like private PIN. So this is not a commonly known piece of knowledge. So you can't use, the, this is not like a username. It's a private PIN that is only known by you. And next off, we have out of, uh, out of band authentication, fingerprint authentication. So uh, if someone doesn't know what uh, out of band authentication is, simply uh, it is simply where you get a push notification to a secondary device that is not your primary device where you are trying to authenticate from, and then then use that. For example, 
you might get a notification saying, uh, uh, are you trying to log into this account? Do you want to approve? And then give your fingerprint on the mobile phone itself. So that is uh, an example of out of band authentication. And one incorrect example is a user identifier and password. Again, uh, as the first one, knowledge. And then a security pin. So this is also a private pin, but it is also classified under knowledge and it's not a, not a correct use of SCA. Now let's talk about the unwanted effects of SCA. Unfortunately, though it's built for security, there is a couple of downsides as, uh, as there is a important part of balancing security and user experience. Existing internet banking customers uh, may not be familiar with uh, multi-factor authentication because some banks already use uh, a private PIN and a primary identifier. So in that case, uh, someone who wants to try out open banking may be deterred. And continued use of SCA may tire customers and cause frictions because uh, since SCA is ma a mandatory requirement, even something small like just getting, just transferring money from one of your accounts to a uh, trusted beneficiary requires SCA and it causes friction where there is uh, a lot of steps to follow. And uh, all of this is simply the third, uh, third point, which is hindrance to user experience. So how can we provide a frictionless experience, uh, frictionless SCA experience? So there has been a couple of research regarding this and uh, as a solution provider, as WS2, Open Banking Solution also provides easy way of uh, uh, giving frictionless SE experiences. So one of the most important thing is introducing your customers to SCA. However, your technology stack and your implementation may be sound. It is important to educate customers on SCA and a strategy is really needed for this process. So what the uh, FCA guidelines said is simply uh, come up with a strategy to roll out SCA incrementally instead of enforcing it uh, on the get-go. So uh, what will this help? This will help, this will ease the SCA process on the initial rollout. So in this case, let's say a bank already has a primary identification. They can simply keep that as a SCA, uh, as CA, I should say, and then uh, then uh, in the second stages, they can introduce my, another factor and uh, uh, completely apply SCA. And as I said, getting customers to adapt SCA compliant second factors, because some may have already second factor authentication that may not play well with PSD2. So in this, in this process, you can incrementally uh, approach customers saying, okay, we need you to adopt a second factor to continue on. So I'll give you a couple of examples. These are based on researches uh, done by Open Banking Integration Entity, and uh, that is the UK uh, regulatory body, and this is of their customer experience guidelines. Uh, this is a very simple one that a lot of people really don't think about, authorization user interfaces. A lot of people, or a lot of customers who are already familiar with digital banking, wants to see the recognizable ASPSP, the bank login page. This reassures that you're communicating with the bank and increases confidence. This is one of the most simple things. In the case of uh, WS2 Open Banking, as a solution provider, we give customizations in a way that you can customize uh, the whole SCA process, including the pages to look like whatever your legacy, legacy open banking portal looked like and clarity of consumer consent. This is again, uh, harkening back to VisiVis, which is what you see is what you sign. So research shows that consumers have shown the, the summary information step, acts as a confirmation of exactly what they have consented to. So in this case, uh, you have to explicit, since the, consume, the, sorry, since the consent process is explicit, you need to show what the third party provider is requesting. So in this case, uh, it's, requ it's requesting an international standing order for every working day for 20 euros. So this will be clear. Uh, taking this forward, some uh, implementers have actually added the added a third factor 
after the consent step. So that is again back to VCBIS, which is uh, what you see is what you sign. So there's a third third step that allows the user to confirm that the, that they consent to this request. And another thing is uh, use of decoupled authentication. Uh, there is a lot of uh, SEA second factors, but they not they may not be so user friendly. Such as SMS OTP. Let's say you get an SMS with a security code, and then you need to type it back into the into the bank portal, and it may kind of seem like a snag on UX. So a lot of people are familiar with decoupled authentication. The the research from OBI shows that people are familiar with decoupled authentication, and it gives them extra layer of uh, uh, kind of security because additional level of security because when in the case of decoupled authentication uh, your secondary authorization device which is running the bank software as well so for an example let's run through this flow quickly so first off uh, the user initiates with the tpp and then the sca process is started with the bank but instead of doing the second factor on the primary consumption device uh, a push notification or some other mechanism is used out of band to a secondary authorization device, which is step three. And then the PSU can approve it and then go back to the consenting process. And then finally, the TPP is consented then the transaction can take place. There's a certain appeal of this because uh, the friction is very low because a lot of people now are with their devices and you don't have to do any manual steps. You just need to authorize on your secondary device and you're ready to go. So a lot of people prefer decoupled authentication. This uh, mainly depends on your user groups and uh, user demographics. So it is always good to have flexibility for someone who may not be using a smart device or someone who prefers more security with like a separate authentication device. So it, your SEA implementation should be flexible to cater that as well. Next up is adaptive authentication. Uh, when the design of PSD2 was out, a lot of parties showed uh, interest and was saying that SCA is going to be a UX nightmare. And what they proposed in the regulatory technical standards uh, for PSD2 is transaction risk analysis. So, which is simply the trans, depending on the transaction, uh, the consenting process will be done using SCA or just consumer authentication. So in this example, let's say your transaction amount is uh, more than 30 euros. If that is the case, you do your basic authentication and the second SA element, and then you get authenticated. But in some cases, like transaction amount is less than 30 euros, or you're transferring money to a trusted beneficiary, then you don't really need the second transaction element, because second uh, SA element, because you already have a lower risk. Therefore, the basic authentication step will take place and then they will be authenticated with C custom authentication. So in this case, uh, the regulatory technical standards have given a set of guidelines, a rule-based system on how adaptive authentication is taking place. So it, it is a clear given guideline on how, how uh, implementers can implement adaptive authentication. Now let's go get on to how WSO2 Open Banking enables effective, uh, strong customer authentication. We provide uh, customization flexibility. So WSO2 Open Banking comes with a lot of customizations. In the, I'm, I'm just going to talk about the in the SC, in context of the SCFO. Uh, we first have custom authenticators, and these can be plug, these can be pluggable authenticators that you can swap out for different authentication processes. So you may already have an identity provider that is doing out-of-band authentication, no problem. So you can come easily plug that in, in some cases with zero code integration as well. And other stuff is, other things are like APIs for consent management. So this is in case you're interested in creating a custom consent portal, maybe to align with your legacy uh, banking system or you have, a you have a custom need. So in that case, you can harness the APIs for consent management to give a custom consent experience. And as I said, 
in the previous slides, uh, we provide authorization portal customizations as well. And authentication freedom, this is again on the SEA elements. So in this case, you can think of an authenticator as an SEA element. And WS2 Open Banking is built on top of the WS2 identity server, which is industry standard. And it comes with the same flexibilities. Since WS2 identity server is, has been around for some time, there is already uh, zero code pluggable authenticators. So your authentication provider may already have uh, a pre-built authenticator by us or other providers that you can easily plug in. When it comes to adaptive authentication capabilities, uh, WS2 Open Banking, as I said, runs on identity server and it has adaptive authentication scripting, which is really powerful. And what this will be able to do, uh, going back to the phased rollout of SCA, is allowing you to configure the authentication steps with zero downtime. So on the get-go, you can simply configure all your authenticators, and then during a certain uh, deadline that you may give to your customers, or when the 18 months run out, you can simply switch out the script, and it will switch to strong customer authentication. So it gives the capabilities to easily, with zero downtime, and even zero uh, configuration, to do this. And next up, for adaptive authentication, you need transaction risk analysis. WS2 Open Banking also offers business intelligence, which is a module uh, that gives out-of-the-box transaction risk analysis on top of fraud detection. And this also comes with integrations to the bank, so you can customize the rule set and also even do risk, uh, even do fraud detection, and it has dashboards to do so. So what are the takeaway points that I want to uh, give? First off, SCA is an integral part of PSD2 Open Banking. As I said, it's the glue that binds uh, binds the consent and the APIs. And again, this is uh, back to uh, dynamic linking as well. The implementation strategy of uh, the implementer will play an important part uh, of open in the adoption adoption of open banking. So this can literally break or make your open banking solution. And uh, as I said, those guidelines are important when it comes to customizing your SEA experience with your customers. And again, I would like to stress on how the SEA flow is the front end for open banking because all of the other technologies are taking back place and customers are not able to see that. So all the assurance is held in place just with this impl implementation strategy for the SEA. Special thought on UX is uh, really necessary when selecting factors for SCA. So in this day and age, it is important to select uh, minimum friction SCA factors instead of going for something like secure codes or even SMS OTP, like uh, choosing for out-of-band authentication. And as I said, flexible SCA options are really good because divided on different consumer groups, some may be familiar with out-of-band authentication or have mobile devices, and maybe some customers don't really use those. And in that, that case, you want to cater all of those demographics. In that case, you can uh, the flexible SE options would be really beneficial, beneficial because uh, in that case, you can simply give SMS or TP to someone or give a separate authentication device uh, for, for maybe a corporation that wants uh, maximum security in the open banking flow. So these are the main takeaway points uh, when it comes to implementation of SCA. And uh, we, we are working with our customers uh, to ensure that their integration journeys and also customer user experience journeys uh, go on the correct path when it comes to SCA. Uh, I'd like to open the floor to questions. Uh, anyone? Got any, if you got any questions, you can uh, post it on the post it on the portal. No question as so far. Uh, let's give it a couple of minutes and see if uh, anyone got any questions. Okay, so we got a question. Uh, if WS2 identity survey is used for open banking solution. How is the end user credentials will be validated with the ASPSP as a legacy system? Uh, good question. So 
WSO2 identity server is uh, highly flexible and it can manage multiple user stores. So in this scenario, in consumer identity or even in open banking, uh, we have to, when, when it comes to integrating the open banking solution, you need to plug in user stores. So this can be something like uh, a legacy Microsoft Active Directory or, or any other LDAP based system. Even if it's not LDAP, you can write a custom user store extension uh, with the resources we have provided and you can do it in Java. So that is how you uh, integrate your legacy system into the open banking, open banking solution for end user credential validation. The same kind of approach is taken for multi-factors as well. So if you have a legacy second factor authentication system, you can integrate that to uh, open banking identity manager as well. I hope I answered that question, uh, Varna. So we got a question on uh, whether the data user stories in WS2 will be under RTS regulations as customer data sh is shared with WS2. No, not at all, actually. Uh, most of our customers run the solution on premise and it doesn't require any sort of uh, outbound connection to WSO2. So when you set up uh, the open banking solution in any configuration with different patterns to handle the load that you'd be, uh, you'd be expecting, it is all under RTS. So we, our uh, software architects will help banks uh, regarding GDPR and the RTS as well. So if they're not interested in running the solution uh, on premise, we will make sure to provide them with a uh, cloud provider that is GDPR compliant and stores the data in the EU. So it can be run on premise or on cloud uh, and it is completely PSD2 and RTS compliant. Yes, it is. Okay, seems like uh, that's all the questions we got. Uh, I hope you uh, gain something from this webinar. And if you have any questions regarding open banking, please contact us uh, through these uh, contact points. You can uh, even get a, you can try out WS2 Open Banking by yourself at openbanking.wso2.com and contact us open banking demo at wso2.com. Uh, thank you all for joining. <laughs>